Is the universe infinite? It's a question that all cosmologists ask themselves, and one that you certainly asked yourself too. At first glance, the answer might seem to be that yes, the universe is infinite. But is it really? Dear Traveler, welcome. Today we're off to explore the universe, discovering the far-flung worlds of the cosmos. But before you set off on your next adventure, remember to like the video and subscribe so you don't miss a thing. Thank you, and have a great trip! universe is infinite? The answer may surprise you. The fact is, we'll probably never know. Theoretically, it's impossible to answer this question. Even though the theory of general relativity allows us to describe the evolution of the entire universe since its birth, it tells us nothing about its geometric properties. All that Einstein's relativistic theory of gravitation tells us is that the curvature of the universe is zero. What does this mean in concrete terms? Let's take three points in space-time. Now let's link these three points together. Without curvature, we get not a pyramid, but a triangle, i.e. a flat object. A flat universe without curvature, and therefore infinite. Not all cosmologists are convinced. To understand this better, we need to look at the universe's three potential typical curvatures and their significance in terms of mass and expansion. The universe could be closed, positive spatial curvature, open, negative spatial curvature, or flat, zero spatial curvature. In an open universe, it is limitless and will continue to expand indefinitely. Its total mass is not large enough to stop this expansion. For a flat universe, although it is also limitless and destined to expand forever, its mass is still sufficient to slow down this expansion until it reaches almost zero, but this would take an infinite amount of time. In a closed universe, on the other hand, the mass is more than enough to slow down and eventually stop the expansion. This universe, although finite, has no edges, as it is comparable to a sphere. When expansion ceases, it will begin to contract. This will bring the galaxies closer together, leading the universe to collapse in on itself. In 2019, the flat universe theory was somewhat shaken by the study of data collected by ESA's Planck Space Telescope. This information, at odds with the data previously collected to establish the cosmological model, suggests that the universe could be finite and spherical in shape, with the positive curvature of 4%. Where does this hypothesis of a spherical universe come from? It's based on a photograph of the cosmic microwave background, a luminous radiation generated by the Big Bang 380,000 years after it took place. This image was taken by the Planck telescope between 2009 and 2013. We can see numerous gravitational lenses, an optical phenomenon created by high mass densities. These high densities twist the fabric of space-time, distorting the path of light. The more deviations we observe, the more this is an indication of the density of matter in the universe. And this is where the theory of relativity comes in. It states that above 5.6 atoms per cubic meter, space twists into a sphere. Using the Planck telescope image, the cosmologist behind this discovery calculated a density of 6 hydrogen atoms per cubic meter. However, 
Not all cosmologists are enthusiastic about this discovery. Most cosmologists point out that measurements from other telescopes show no curvature and that further measurements are needed to settle the matter. But the observable universe is finite. The observable universe is a fraction of the universe as a whole, the fraction that is visible. The observable universe is finite because it has a finite age. The age of the universe is simply the time elapsed since the Big Bang. The universe may have existed before the Big Bang, but current cosmological models are unable to describe the behavior of matter at such a high temperature and intense gravity as at the time of the Big Bang. The age of the universe was established in 2020 at 13.77 billion years with a margin of error of plus or minus 0.040 billion years. If the universe has a finite age and light propagates in a vacuum at a finite speed, then the observable universe is finite. One light year corresponds to the distance traveled by light in one year. Thus, the size of the observable universe is a sphere of 13.77 billion light years delimited by the cosmological horizon centered on the observer's position, which for us is the Earth. But this represents only a small portion of the entire universe. To know whether the universe is infinite or not, we need to know its curvature. As you can see, we can't really say for sure that the universe is infinite. But we can still explore the observable universe, that fraction of the universe that is visible. Together, we'll discover what the observable universe is how it was discovered and theorized, what its dimensions are, and what objects it contains. Fasten your seatbelts, the journey begins now. The observable universe is the name given to the visible part of our universe in cosmology. As we have seen, the observable universe is finite. Its boundary is called the cosmological horizon. This horizon is the limit of the universe observable from a given point, usually the Earth. It may correspond to the limit from which electromagnetic radiation can be emitted, or the limit from which a signal of any type, such as gravitational waves or neutrinos, can be received. The cosmological horizon can also be defined as the boundary between the visible part of the universe, made up of objects whose light will have traveled for less than 13.7 billion years, and the invisible part of the universe, whose galaxies are too far away for their light to have had time to reach us. However, to say that the cosmological horizon is 13.7 billion light years away is a simplification as it does not take into account the expansion of the universe. If we add the expansion of the universe into the equation, we can say that the photons emitted by the cosmological horizon are located more than 13.7 billion light years from us today, because the speed of the expansion of the universe is faster than the speed of light. In reality, the most distant signals that reach an observer on Earth come from the cosmic microwave background, a radiation that fills the entire universe, but whose region of emission is located at the edge of the observable universe. This region is known as the last scattering surface. Cosmological models estimate that the last scattering surface is now 46.5 billion light years away due to the expansion of the universe. The observable universe can be described as a sphere with the Earth at its center. This is not geocentrism, the ancient physical model according to which the Earth was immobile at the center of the universe. Our planet is at the center of the observable universe, 
simply because observers are located on Earth. This is a relative notion. Observers located elsewhere in the universe would not have the same observable universe, but the radius of this sphere would be the same. The observable universe is defined by what is observable and measurable. The further we advance in time, the more distant objects we can observe, as their light finally reaches us. The observable universe thus expands over time. The visible ray is one light second larger with each passing second, or one light year larger with each passing year. We can also put it this way. Light travels at a speed of 300,000 kilometers per second. With each passing second, we discover a new depth of space of 300,000 kilometers. In a single year, we can discover several new galaxies. Objects at the very edge of the observable universe are observed in their primitive state because they are the ones whose light has taken the longest to reach us, billions of light years. And the further away the objects are, the higher their redshift, due to the expansion of the universe. The cosmological principle of homogeneity and isotropy is important for a better understanding of the observable universe. This principle is one of the four cosmological principles which are in fact simplifying hypotheses essential to understanding cosmology without having to know the velocities and positions of all particles in space, which would be impossible. Today, the cosmological principle of homogeneity and isotropy is considered to have been verified First, it states that the universe is spatially homogeneous. In other words, its general appearance does not depend on the position of the observer. This postulate is in line with Copernicus's principle, stated in opposition to geocentrism, according to which there is no privileged point of view in the universe. The cosmological principle of homogeneity and isotropy also assumes that the observable universe is isotropic, i.e., that its appearance does not depend on the direction in which it is observed. For example, the expansion rate of the universe, i.e., the apparent recession velocity of galaxies, located at a given distance, is the same, regardless of the direction in which it is observed. The observable universe is thus like a ball, whose center is the observer, and whose radius is the distance traveled by a light signal during the time the universe has existed at that instant. Even though we're talking about an observable universe, you should be aware that certain regions of the observable universe are not visible. For example, we can't observe the regions behind black holes, whether stellar or supermassive. Let's briefly recall the difference between the two. Stellar black holes result from the gravitational collapse of massive stars, while supermassive black holes located at the center of galaxies are still the subject of active research into their formation. But just because we can't observe these parts of the universe doesn't mean they don't exist. Current theoretical models enable us to understand the universe as a whole, even if we can only see a fraction of it. Certainly, observing the observable universe presents some challenges. It's hard enough to imagine that even though the observable universe may appear finite, it's actually situated within a much larger and even potentially infinite whole. It can also be difficult to conceive that even if we can observe and measure the universe, we'll never see it as it is at the moment we observe it. The notion of look-back time is important in understanding this. 
look-back time is an estimate of the time since which the light from a distant astronomical object was emitted. This estimate is calculated as a function of the object's redshift. We estimate the object's age in cosmic time, then convert it into light years to determine the distance light has traveled from the object to Earth. Let's take the example of primordial galaxy HUDF JD2. A primordial galaxy is one that formed directly from ordinary and dark matter in the early universe, just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. Primordial galaxies are contrasted with galaxies that formed later, or by the merging of two earlier galaxies. HUDF JD2 has a redshift of z equals 6.5, which once the formula is applied, gives a look-back time of 850 million years after the Big Bang. HUDF JD2 is one of some 10,000 galaxies in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, created by the Hubble Space Telescope in 2004. It is notable for its mass of 600 billion solar masses. Its discovery astonished astronomers because at the time, no other object this massive was known to have formed so early in the history of the universe. Distant objects like HUDF JD2 do not appear as they are when we observe them, but as they were when their light was emitted. When we observe HUDF JD2, we're observing the galaxy as it was several billion years ago. What's more, the further away the objects are, the younger they are observed in cosmic time. Assessing the age of observed objects in the universe is highly complex. To simplify matters, we first need to observe the shift of spectral lines in the electromagnetic spectrum of the observed object, which measures the redshift. Then we need to convert it into cosmic time, which depends on the cosmological model used. The cosmological model can be the cosmological principle, the expansion model, or a model based on parameters such as the Hubble constant, which are often imprecise. The greater the redshift, the more distant the observed object. We also need to differentiate between the distance at which light is received and the distance at which it is emitted. The reception distance is the distance at which the object appears to us when we receive the signal. It is greater than the speed of light, due to the expansion of the universe. The emission distance is the distance at which they were at the moment they emitted their light. This distance is therefore closer to us. Another challenge in observing the universe is the fact that objects become less and less visible the further away they are. The more distant the objects, the less visible and energetic the light received. This is one of the reasons for the finiteness of the observable universe. At a certain distance, objects can no longer be observed and are therefore no longer part of the visible universe. As the universe expands, the distances between the various objects that make up the observable universe are in perpetual motion. The boundaries of the sphere that is the visible universe are therefore quite blurred and shifting. Every year, galaxies in the observable universe disappear into the unobservable. But at the same time, new galaxies also become visible every year, as their light finally reaches us as we move further away from the date of the Big Bang. Observations give the impression that individual cosmic objects such as supernovas, stars or galaxies, are moving further and further apart. This is not, as you might think, due to an increase in the speed of their movement, 
but to an accelerated increase in the production of space between each galaxy. The expansion of the universe is described by Hubble's constant. This does not refer to a literal duplication of space, but to its continuous expansion. The Hubble constant, with an approximate value of 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec, means that on average, for every megaparsec of distance separating two points in the universe, these points are moving away from each other at a speed of around 70 kilometers per second, or 43 miles per second. So this constant describes the relationship between the speed at which two points in the universe move away from each other and the distance between them, not the addition of new space. All this is already quite complex, and yet there are still other parameters to take into account to understand how the observable universe works. As we saw at the start of this journey, the universe is 13.77 billion years old, or 14 billion years old to round it off. It would be tempting to say that the size of the observable universe is 14 billion light years. Since this is the age of the universe, the light emitted by an object in the observable universe cannot have traveled more than 14 billion years. The most distant objects we can observe should therefore be located 14 billion light years away. But it's not that simple. Due to the expansion of the universe, the origin of the light particles emitted by these distant objects has moved further away from us since they were first emitted. What we're looking for, then, is the geometric distance at which these distant objects, whose light we receive 14 billion light years later, are located. To do this, we first need to adopt a cosmological model. Then, from the speed of expansion of space, we need to deduce the distance these objects will have traveled, since the photons were emitted. Based on the current cosmological model, cosmologists estimate that the radius of the observable universe is around 46.5 billion light years today. The observable universe would therefore be an Earth-centered sphere with a radius of 46.5 billion light years, or 450,000 billion billion kilometers. The diameter of the observable universe would therefore be estimated at 93 billion light years. It's also interesting to note that we can only theoretically observe objects up to the distance of the cosmic microwave background, i.e. around 380,000 years after the Big Bang, when the universe had cooled down enough to allow electrons to join atomic nuclei. This phenomenon freed photons, and therefore light, which had previously been trapped in a fog of matter, and stopped the Compton effect. As a result, photons were able to survive long enough to reach Earth and be observed by our instruments. The Compton effect, also known as Compton scattering, was discovered in 1923 by Nobel Prize-winning physicist Arthur Compton. It results from the collision between the photon particle and the electron. It shows that the photon is a real particle, characterized by energy and momentum. This discovery changed many things, as it showed that light could behave as a beam of particles, whereas until then, it had only been described as a wave. Let's go back to 380,000 years after the Big Bang. It would theoretically be possible to extract information from the 380,000 years that elapsed after the Big Bang and before the universe had cooled down enough for its photons to reach us. To do this, we'd need to detect gravitational waves or fossil neutrinos, which have never been discovered. 
What you need to remember is not to confuse the size of the observable universe, which is limited by the cosmological horizon, with its geometric size. This difference is important because it allows us to understand things that may at first glance seem paradoxical, such as the fact that we can observe a galaxy located 16 billion light years away from us when the Big Bang only took place 13.7 billion years ago. In this example, 16 billion light years corresponds to the geometric distance of the galaxy in question, taking into account the expansion of the universe. But at the time, when the light reaching us today was scattered, it could have been located just 10 billion light years from us, for example. We know the size of the observable universe, but what about its mass? Using various methods, scientists have been able to estimate the amount of matter present in the observable part of our universe. It is thought to be on the order of 10 to the 80th power atoms. More often than not, the question of the mass of the universe is addressed in terms of density and energy, rather than mass. In fact, the universe is above all made up of matter and energy. Since the start of our journey, we've mentioned the age of the observable universe several times, which has been estimated at around 13.77 billion years. This is a finite age, representing the time that has elapsed since the Big Bang, or the appearance of space-time. Determining the age of the universe has long been a challenge for astronomers, it was only recently that researchers at Cornell University in the USA estimated the age of the universe at 13.77 billion years, with a margin of error of 40 million years. To arrive at this estimate, the researchers relied on cosmological diffuse background data that were collected by the Atacama Cosmological Telescope in Chile between 2013 and 2016. They also confirmed their estimate with data and measurements taken by ESA's Planck Space Observatory between 2009 and 2013. The age estimated by the Cornell University researchers is hundreds of millions of years younger than the one estimated in 2019. This age has several implications. Firstly, the light emitted by a cosmic object cannot have traveled more than 13.8 billion years. The light emitted by the most distant objects we can detect at the edge of the observable universe therefore took 13.8 billion years to reach us. 13 billion years is the co-moving distance between us and the furthest point in the observable universe. But it's not the geometric distance between these two points as we saw earlier. The geometric distance differs due to the expansion of the universe and is 46.5 billion light years. You now know the age of the observable universe, its size and mass, and how difficult and complex it is to study a space in perpetual motion, with blurred boundaries that redefine themselves every second. You're ready to begin our journey into the heart of the observable universe, to discover the cosmic objects it contains. Let's start by looking at how the observable universe is organized Argentinian artist Pablo Carlos Budasi has created a magnificent detailed map of the observable universe in the shape of a sphere, showing its various layers. This impressive image was created using a logarithmic scale. The artist worked with astronomical data obtained by a team from Princeton University in the USA. The result is breathtaking. It's like seeing the entire observable universe in fisheye through a keyhole. 
At the center of this sphere, you can see the solar system. For an observer on Earth, the sphere that makes up the observable universe has our planet at its center. You can see the Sun, around which revolve the Earth and the other planets of our solar system. Mercury and Venus, closer to the Sun than we are, then Mars, Jupiter, Saturn with its ring, and Uranus and Neptune, the blue planets. Adjacent to the Earth, you can even see the Moon. Around our solar system, you can see the two asteroid belts, the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud, which look like rings of dust. The Kuiper Belt extends between 30 and 55 astronomical units beyond the orbit of Neptune. It is similar to the Asteroid Belt, a ring of billions of asteroids that lies between Mars and Jupiter and formed at the same time as our solar system 4.6 billion years ago. However, the Kuiper Belt is 20 times wider and 20 to 200 times more massive than the Asteroid Belt. It is made up of small bodies and at least three dwarf planets, Pluto, Makimaki, and Haumea. These small bodies include hundreds of thousands of icy bodies over 100 kilometers or 62 miles in length, and several billion comets with orbital periods of around 200 years. As early as 1951, Dutch-American astronomer Gerard Kuiper predicted the existence of the Kuiper Belt, hence the name given to the ring. However, it was not until 1992, 19 years after his death, that 1992QB1 was discovered. It was the first Kuiper Belt object to be discovered, after Pluto in 1930 and its satellite Charon in 1978. Pluto remains the best-known Kuiper Belt object. Previously considered the ninth planet in the solar system, it was downgraded to a dwarf planet in 2006. Conversely, Triton, Neptune's largest satellite, may have been a Kuiper Belt object captured by the planet. The second asteroid belt you can see, in Pablo Carlos Badassi's representation of the observable universe, is the Oort Cloud. This one has never been observed, so it's hypothetical. In reality, the Oort Cloud is not a ring but a sphere made up of frozen comets. In 1950, Dutch astronomer Jan Hendrik Oort published the results of his work on long-period comets. In his work, the astronomer found that the orbits of the long-period comets known in 1950 had their aphiles, i.e., the point at which they are at greatest distance from the Sun, at distances of the order of 20,000 to 100,000 astronomical units from the Sun. He concluded that between these distances from the Sun, there exists a reservoir of comets revolving in circular orbits, and that this reservoir of comets has a spherical shape. The outer limit of the Oort cloud would form the gravitational boundary of the solar system, this cloud remains hypothetical because it has never been observed, but many scientists believe it must exist to explain the analyses carried out on comet orbits. Because the objects in the Oort cloud are predominantly composed of ices such as water, methane, and ammonia, astronomers believe that this material formed closer to the Sun and was scattered far out into space by the gravitational effect of the giant planets at the start of the solar system's evolution. Let's continue our exploration of the observable universe. After the Oort cloud, and therefore outside our solar system, you can observe the Alpha Centauri star system, located 4.37 light-years from Earth. 
Alpha Centauri is the closest star and planetary system to our solar system, or more precisely, it's the closest star system to our solar system at present, because everything in the universe is in motion. However, this system is likely to retain its status for a long time to come, as it takes our Sun 230 million years to circle the Milky Way. The Alpha Centauri system is made up of three stars, Alpha Centauri A, Alpha Centauri B, and Alpha Centauri C, the best known, also known as Proxima Centauri. Stars A and B form a double star, and Proxima Centauri is a less luminous red dwarf. The latter is thought to have been captured by the double star system and is now gravitationally linked to both stars. It was discovered rather late in 1915. So why is it the best known star in this system? Quite simply, because it's the closest of the three stars to the Sun, making it the closest star to our solar system. Or at least it's been the closest star to us for around 32,000 years and will remain so for another 33,000. So it's hardly surprising that astronomers have turned their attention to the possibility that the planets in this system could harbor extraterrestrial life. Proxima Centauri b is of particular interest to astronomers as it lies in the habitable zone of the Proxima Centauri star around which it orbits. But that's not all. This planet shares many features in common with our Earth. It's a rocky planet, and its mass is similar to that of the Earth. All these parameters make the presence of liquid water possible on this exoplanet. However, there are obstacles to life on this planet, not least the proximity of its star, which is an active red dwarf. The planet therefore receives 400 times more X-rays than we do on Earth. Not only should this have severely eroded the planet's atmosphere, if any, but it also makes it difficult for life to develop as we know it. There's another thing. Although we haven't been able to verify it with our own eyes, it's highly likely that the planet and its star are gravitationally locked, meaning that Proxima Centauri b always presents the same face to its star. On this planet, there would therefore be one hemisphere where it's permanently dark and cold, and another where it's far too hot to allow the existence of water in a liquid state, and therefore the development of life. Astronomers are not giving up hope, however. Habitable regions may exist along the Terminator, the fictitious line that separates these two extreme hemispheres. In this zone, temperatures would be temperate. And if the planet's atmosphere is thick enough, it could even transfer heat from one side of the planet to the other, considerably increasing the size of potentially habitable zones. Let's return to Pablo Carlos Bedassi's map of the observable universe. After the Alpha Centauri system, you can see the Perseus arm of the Milky Way, our own galaxy, some 6,000 light years away. The Perseus spiral arm is one of the four main spiral arms of the Milky Way. In fact, our galaxy is a barred spiral galaxy with four major arms and at least two minor ones. Located between the Cygnus and Sagittarius arms, it is so named because of its proximity to the constellation of Perseus. Even if observations tend to qualify the Milky Way as a spiral galaxy, like galaxy M81 for example, we don't really know the exact shape of our galaxy because we only see it from the inside. Astrophysicists use a variety of methods to make 3D models of our galaxy, determining the relative positions of the objects in it. 
One method is to measure the position of stars and interstellar clouds in the sky, as well as their velocity relative to us. In this way, we can deduce their distance. However, 3D modeling based on this method is approximate, as we have to assume that these celestial objects revolve regularly around the center of the Milky Way, and that there are no random movements or matter interferences. Another method consists of measuring star distances using the parallax between two successive observations for two opposite positions of the Earth in relation to the Sun. Scientists have been able to use this method thanks to the European Gaia Astrometry Satellite. The results obtained were compared with spectrometric data on the presence of interstellar dust to take into account the quantity of interstellar matter between us and each star. Using this method, astrophysicists were able to model the Perseus arm and realize that in reality, it appears much more dispersed than previously thought. It could therefore be that the Milky Way is not a grand spiral galaxy like Messier 81, but rather a galaxy with short fragmented spiral arms like Messier 83. Whatever the case, the Milky Way lies at the heart of the observable universe, in what is known as the Local Group. The Local Group is a group of over 60 galaxies with a diameter of 10 million light years. The two most massive galaxies in the Local Group are the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy, or M31. Both spiral galaxies, they are separated by around 2.5 million light years. And yet, it's very likely that one day they will collide. They are approaching each other at more than 400,000 kilometers per hour, or 250,000 miles per hour. But this collision is still 4.5 billion years away. To begin with, human beings will certainly no longer be on Earth, as our Sun will have begun its transformation into a red giant, and life on Earth will come to an end in 2.8 billion years. But this collision would present no danger to our solar system, since the distance between the stars is so great that the probability of two stellar systems colliding remains very low. In fact, all this collision between two galaxies could cause is the destruction of a few stars, the birth of others, and the creation of a new mega-galaxy with a supermassive black hole, composed of the two black holes of the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy. As you'll have gathered, the Andromeda Galaxy is one of our galaxy's most important neighbors, that's why it's featured in Pablo Carlos Badassi's image. You may also hear it referred to as M31 or NGC 224. Larger than the Milky Way, it has a diameter of 220,000 light years and is located 2.55 million light years from the Sun in the Andromeda constellation. Mistaken for a nebula until the 1920s, this galaxy is magnificent and above all very luminous. It is thought to contain around a thousand billion stars, or two to five times more than our own galaxy, for a total luminosity equivalent to 26 billion times that of the Sun. It is therefore 25% more luminous than the Milky Way. But this may not last, as our galaxy's star formation rate is three to five times higher than that of the Andromeda Galaxy. On top of that, our galaxy contains twice as many supernovas, so it's possible that one day in the distant future, its luminosity will surpass that of its rival, the Andromeda Galaxy. Discovered as early as 964, observed in 1612, 
and first photographed in 1887, the Andromeda Galaxy has long been a household name, and for good reason. It's one of the few galaxies you can observe with a naked eye from Earth. More precisely, from the Northern Hemisphere. That's right, this galaxy has an apparent diameter six times that of the Moon from Earth. This galaxy is thought to have formed relatively recently, less than three billion years ago, when the Earth already existed. Astronomers attribute its formation to the collision of two galaxies. It has a number of so-called satellite galaxies, notably the Triangulum Galaxy, or M33, the third largest galaxy in the local group after M31 and the Milky Way. The Triangulum Galaxy is also a spiral galaxy and lies 750,000 light years from the Andromeda Galaxy. It can also be seen with the naked eye from Earth, but only from the Southern Hemisphere and under the right conditions. Apart from the Triangulum Galaxy, M31's other satellites probably include the irregular dwarf Pisces Galaxy, the spheroidal dwarf galaxy, NGC 185, the irregular dwarf galaxy, IC 10, and the spheroidal dwarf galaxy, Andromeda 2. There are many, many more, but we won't be able to explore them all. In 2016, the number of galaxies in the observable universe was revised upwards. It is now thought to contain 2,000 billion galaxies, 20 times more than previously thought. The discovery published in the Astrophysical Journal was made by an international team of researchers led by Christopher Consolis of the University of Nottingham. The researchers converted Hubble Deep Field images into 3D images by counting existing galaxies by space-time slice until they reached 13 billion years into the past. At each period, they assessed the density of galaxies, although the further back in time, the more complicated the task. Indeed, the more distant the galaxies, the less visible they are, or the more redshifted they are. So they use mathematical models to deduce the number of galaxies as a function of time. Their conclusion? The density of galaxies evolves inversely with the age of the universe. Their study showed that galaxies are not uniformly distributed over time, when the universe was still young, i.e. only a few billion years old, the number of galaxies present in a given volume of space was ten times greater than in the nearby universe. However, as most of these galaxies are dwarf galaxies like those found in the Milky Way, 90% are undetectable with today's telescopes. This study raises many questions including how the universe evolved to reduce the number of galaxies to such an extent. Perhaps through galactic mergers? Scientists are also interested in how these galaxies are organized in the observable universe. Researchers have noticed a tendency for galaxies to group together in clusters or even superclusters. Superclusters are groups of galaxy clusters. Here are a few examples to give you a clearer idea. The local group is a group of galaxies comprising over 60 galaxies such as the Milky Way, the Andromeda Galaxy, and the Triangulum Galaxy. The Virgo Cluster is a galaxy cluster containing between 1300 and 2000 galaxies. 90% of which are dwarf galaxies. Galaxy clusters are more massive than galaxy groups and contain more hot gas. The Virgo supercluster, with the Virgo cluster at its center, is a supercluster of galaxies. 
Superclusters are groups of galaxies up to hundreds of millions of light years across, containing several dozen groups and clusters of galaxies. They are of interest to scientists because it is on the scale of superclusters that we can see the expansion of the universe. Indeed, it's at this scale that the red shift, or if the objects are approaching us, the blue shift is felt. Conversely, groups or clusters of galaxies are gravitationally bound together, with a gravitational force strong enough to resist the expansion of the universe. The Virgo supercluster is particularly well known as the home of our local group. That's why it's also called the local supercluster. It is located around 65 million light years from us and was discovered gradually from 1863 when numerous nebulae were observed in this area. It was established in the 70s and 80s that this supercluster was indeed a structure and not simply a grouping of nebulae. Unlike the Andromeda Galaxy, the Virgo supercluster is not very luminous. In fact, it is very dim relative to the number of stars it contains, leading scientists to conclude that it is largely composed of dark matter. There are many other superclusters in the observable universe. The closest supercluster to the local supercluster is the Hydra Centaur supercluster, which actually comprises two superclusters, the Centaur supercluster and the Hydra supercluster. This supercluster is also rather well known to the general public, as it contains the famous Great Attractor, that mysterious zone towards which the local group and the Virgo supercluster converge at a speed of around 625 kilometers per second, or 390 miles per second. This zone is actually located near the Ruler Cluster, the third subset of the Hydra Centaur Supercluster. It exerts such a powerful gravitational force that all matter within a radius of around 165 million light years flows into it. The Hydra and Centaur Superclusters are often studied together, even though they are two distinct superclusters separated by 150 to 200 million light years. The Centaur Supercluster is not easily observable from Earth, as the region of sky in which it lies is crossed by the Milky Way. For this reason, photographs of this supercluster are not very sharp and are obscured by numerous stars in the foreground. But the Centaur Supercluster is interesting nonetheless, as it contains four galaxy-rich clusters and hundreds of smaller galaxy groups. As for the Hydra supercluster, it contains only one galaxy-rich cluster, as it extends over only around 100 million light years. This is the Hydra cluster, and it remains one of the three largest galaxy clusters within 200 million light years of us. Other known superclusters include the Shapely Supercluster, 650 million light years away, in the Centaur constellation. This cluster is gigantic. Here is a little background to give you an idea of just how huge this supercluster is. Our little planet is located in the Milky Way, which in turn is located in the local group. Our galaxy group is in the Virgo Supercluster, which along with the Hydra Centaur Supercluster and the Peacock Indian Supercluster is one of three superclusters in a larger hole called Laniakea. And beyond Laniakea is the Shapely Supercluster, an even larger supercluster to which Laniakea is attracted. The Shapely Supercluster is located in the Centaurus constellation 650 million light years from us, behind the Centaurus Supercluster. 
it contains 25 galaxy clusters that are very close together, condensed into an area the size of the Virgo supercluster, which contains just one large galaxy cluster. In 1936, American astrophysicist Harlow Shapley estimated that 76,000 galaxies were concentrated in this region. It was this discovery that led to the later discovery of the Shapley supercluster. So it's only natural that astronomers should name the supercluster after this astrophysicist. Let's continue our exploration of superclusters in the observable universe. Close to Laniakea and the Shapley supercluster are the Hercules supercluster, the Bernice supercluster, and the Perseus Poisson supercluster. The Perseus Pisces supercluster is an important supercluster recognized by its unusual shape. Indeed, as you can see, it forms a long, dense wall of galaxies, almost 300 million light years long. It contains the Perseus Cluster, one of the most massive galaxy clusters within 500 million light years of us, and the second closest cluster after the Ruler Cluster to contain thousands of galaxies. But unlike the Ruler Cluster, hidden by the plane of the Milky Way, it's easy to observe. The Hercules Supercluster is located in the constellation of Hercules, hence its name. It consists of two interconnected superclusters of galaxies, the best known of which is dominated by two galaxy-rich clusters, A2197 and A2199, but this is not the largest of the two superclusters. The second supercluster contains several rich clusters and hundreds of small groups of galaxies. It is dominated by three galaxy clusters, A2147, A2151, and A2152. The Hare of Bernice supercluster, also known as the Coma supercluster, is the closest supercluster to Earth, at 300 million light years. There are two particularly well known clusters in this supercluster the Hare of Bernice or Coma cluster and the Leo cluster. As well as being interesting for understanding the expansion of the universe, Superclusters enable scientists to better understand the organization of matter in the observable universe. Researchers have discovered that superclusters are not homogeneously distributed. On the contrary, there are huge gaps between some superclusters, i.e., spaces without galaxy clusters spanning several hundred million light years. Over 90% of the universe is thus made up of empty space. Does this surprise you? Actually, it's quite logical. When you look at the sky, you don't point your telescope at areas of emptiness, but at areas where you can see multiple points of light. In the same way, researchers, whatever their motivation, finding a habitable planet, understanding star formation, or the organization of the universe tend to observe regions of the sky where planets, stars, and galaxies can be seen. As a result, the images you see, such as those from the James Webb Telescope, are not representative of the universe as a whole. Some voids are particularly well known, as they are much studied by researchers, notably the Bouvier Void, which is adjacent to the Shapley supercluster, and one of whose edges is bounded by the Hercules supercluster. The Bouvier Void is so named because the few galaxies it contains are neighbors of the Bouvier constellation. Yes, it's called a void because it contains very few galaxies, but that doesn't mean there's really nothing there. In fact, 
Voids in the universe are regions where there is significantly less matter than average. Also known as the Great Void, the Bouvier Void is spherical in shape and nearly 330 million light years in diameter, making it one of the largest known voids in the observable universe. It is also known as a super void. In the end, it was discovered rather by chance. A team led by Harvard professor Robert Kirshner discovered the void in 1981 during a survey of galaxy redshifts. Astronomers subsequently discovered a few galaxies in this apparently empty region, but not many. In 1997, there were an estimated 60 galaxies in the Bouvier Void. These galaxies are isolated and distant from one another, so that they are spread across a volume almost two and a half times larger than that of the Virgo supercluster, which contains over 10,000 galaxies. In fact, these galaxies are so isolated within the Bouvier Void that if the Milky Way were at the center of this void, we wouldn't have known the other galaxies existed until the middle of the last century. How can we explain this relatively empty zone? One theory that has been put forward is that the void formed from other voids in the way that several soap bubbles can agglomerate to form a larger one. This phenomenon, whereby several identical but dispersed substances tend to come together, is known as coalescence. But then how were the first voids formed, the ones that came together to form supervoids, like the Bouvier void? These voids were certainly very small irregularities in the early universe, which grew considerably larger as the universe expanded. The Bouvier Void is just one of many void regions to be found in the observable universe. Thousands of void zones have been catalogued by researchers, with diameters ranging from 30 to 300 million light years. Very close to our local group, we also find the local void whose size is estimated at around 200 million light years. Not far away, you can also see the Boreal local supervoid, which is devoid of any galactic clusters over a diameter of almost 340 million light years. And if we extrapolate the definition of the cosmic vacuum, we currently find ourselves in the largest known void in the observable universe, the KBC Void. It's seven times larger than the average and stretches over nearly two billion light years. It encompasses our galaxy and thousands of others around us. It is one of the least dense regions in space. This means that if we lived on another planet outside this KBC Void, we'd certainly have a night sky that was more starry and less dark than Earth's. The study of voids is of growing interest to researchers who see it as an opportunity to better understand the organization of the observable universe. Indeed, the contours of these void lines are drawn by the filaments of galaxies formed by superclusters, or rather, as the researchers believe, it is the voids that have driven galaxies to group together in clusters or filaments to form clusters and superclusters. As the universe ages, the space inside the voids increases in volume, and the surrounding matter shifts and packs. Let's continue our journey into the observable universe. You're looking at the largest structure known to date in the observable universe, the Great Wall of Hercules and the Boreal Crown, named after the constellations in which it lies. Located 10 billion light years away, the Great Wall is an immense structure measuring 10 billion 
by 7.2 billion light years. It is the largest galactic filament known to date. It contains several thousand galaxies divided into clusters and superclusters, including the Hair of Bernice supercluster. Discovered in 2013, it broke the record held since 2003 by the Sloan Great Wall, which with its dimensions of 1.3 billion light years was considered the largest observable structure in the universe. The Great Sloan Wall is closer to home, at just 1 billion light years. Other huge structures in the observable universe include the Great Boss Wall, discovered in 2016, a network of four galaxy superclusters containing at least 830 galaxies. With a mass 10,000 times that of the Milky Way, this superstructure is sure to impress. We're approaching the very edge of the observable universe. 13.5 billion light years away lies galaxy HD1, the most distant galaxy ever observed. The discovery of this galaxy was announced on April 7, 2022 in a press release from the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. For the moment, not much is known about this distant galaxy, except that it is actively forming new stars, perhaps more than 100 per year. Because this would be rather unusual for a galaxy of this type, scientists believe it could contain population 3 stars, this type of star remains hypothetical for the moment, as no Population 3 stars have yet been directly observed. These are the stars that were formed at the very beginning of the universe. This galaxy may contain a supermassive black hole 100 million times the mass of the Sun. This hypothesis could explain HD1's unusual brightness. If so, it would be a historic discovery, as it would be the first known black hole so soon after the Big Bang. To study HD1, the researchers used over 1,200 hours of observations from various observatories in Hawaii and Chile, as well as from the Spitzer Space Telescope, which is no longer in operation. HD1 which is thought to have formed just 300 million years after the Big Bang, broke the record for the oldest and most distant galaxy, previously held by the GNZ11 galaxy, located 13.4 billion light years away in the Big Dipper constellation. All the structures we have observed on this journey form what is known as the cosmic web, a term that aptly describes the interconnected filaments of galaxies, which weave and organize themselves like a gigantic spider's web around the voids of the universe and delimit matter-rich spaces. This impressive 3D representation of the cosmic web was made possible by Roland Bacon, a researcher at the Centre de Recherche Astrophysique de Lyon and the CNRS and his team. It is the result of 140 hours of observation of a region of the sky with a very large telescope at the European Southern Observatory in Chile, coupled with the MUSE instrument. In this image you can see several filaments of the cosmic web as they were just 1 to 2 billion years after the Big Bang. Let's return to Pablo Carlos Bodasi's image. Around the cosmic web on the edges of the sphere, you can see the cosmic microwave background, which is in fact the remnant of the universe's first radiation around 380,000 years after the Big Bang when light, previously trapped in matter, escaped. 
Why is it called the cosmic microwave background? Diffuse because it does not come from a localized source. Cosmological because it is present throughout the observable universe. It is also known as fossil radiation because it has been present since the very first instance of the universe. In any case, it was predicted as early as 1948 and discovered shortly afterwards in 1964, somewhat by chance. Its discovery validated the cosmological model based on the idea of the Big Bang. The final layer of this sphere by Pablo Carlos Budasi is a ring of quark-gluon plasma. This ring lies at the boundary of the observable universe. Beyond it lies the unknown. This invisible plasma corresponds to the cosmological horizon. But what is this plasma of quarks and gluons? It's a state of matter that exists at extremely high temperatures and densities. It's not solid, liquid, or gaseous. It's like a soup of quarks and gluons. When the universe was hot, the nuclei of atoms would have vaporized, resulting in a gas of hadrons. In other words, not a gas of molecules or atoms, but a gas with protons, neutrons, and other particles of quarks and antiquarks. This plasma was certainly present during the first 20 to 30 microseconds after the Big Bang, and it could also be found in some very dense stars, but it's impossible to study it directly. Researchers have to recreate it in the laboratory, in particle gas petals. We have now reached the end of our journey through the observable universe. Yes, the universe is probably infinite, but the observable universe can be studied to its very limits. And perhaps one day, thanks to the study of our universe, will finally be able to unravel all the mysteries of its origin.